A Virginia prison is in the hands of the inmates. A terrifying escape frees six killers from death row. Uh, As the men run free, police race against time to track and capture the fugitives before they kill again. Mecklenburg Correctional Center is the pride of Virginia's prison system. Completed in 1977 at a cost of $20 million, it is state of the art. The sea pod of Building One houses Virginia's most dangerous criminals, the death row inmates. The double gated entrance or the sally port is the only way in and there is no other way out. Officer Ron Sawyer is informed a bomb has been found in C-Pod. He is ordered to bring a van to the front of the prison immediately so the bomb unit can move and dispose of the bomb. Prison policy strictly forbids opening both gates at once. This is a matter of life and death. The bomb disposal team, dressed in protective gear, rushes from the building. is smoking. One of the men sprays the device with a fire extinguisher, apparently to keep it cool. The greatest crisis in Mecklenburg's short history has been resolved through the quick actions of a few brave men. The bomb is safely outside the prison gates. But the crisis is only beginning. What seemed like a bomb evacuation had actually been an escape. The guards are now captives, and six of Virginia's most notorious killers are free. A big manhunt underway for six convicted murderers who broke out of a state prison in Mecklenburg County, Virginia during the night. The inmates were all on death row. The six overpowered guards with homemade knives and drove out with a prison van. As news of the escape spreads, it sends shockwaves through the state's law enforcement authorities. It is the first time death row inmates have escaped in U.S. history. In this program, some of the names have been changed. The Virginia State Police and the Bureau of Criminal Investigation officials are awakened from their beds. The governor of Virginia issues a state of alert to the Army and Air National Guard. The director of the investigative division of the state police, James Lettner, is brought in to supervise the investigation. The governor was extremely concerned for uh, the safety of any citizens that these escapees might come in contact with. He had been briefed on the, the uh, background 
of these individuals. He was aware that each one was awaiting uh, execution uh, for murder or mass murders. And he was extremely concerned uh, that we apprehend these individuals as quickly as possible. Investigator Letner arrives after the killers have been on the road for over 30 minutes. He immediately establishes a search perimeter. Because the inmates are driving a prison van, police will increase the search area every hour. Letner meets with the warden to learn about the men who escaped. The news isn't good. The six fugitives have been convicted of killing a total of 17 people. The two most dangerous escapees are the Briley brothers, James and Linwood. The Briley's ran a vicious Richmond area gang. Police suspected they had slaughtered anywhere from 11 to 20 people. Earl Clanton killed a Virginia woman just months after being paroled for killing an elderly New Jersey woman. Lem Tuggle raped and murdered two elderly women. Derek Peterson killed a supermarket manager after robbing him of $6,000. Willie Leroy Jones murdered and robbed an elderly couple. He asked the wife to pray for him before shooting her and setting the house on fire. These are the men who escaped from Mecklenburg's death row. Most of them killed more than once and would likely kill again if given a chance. It never occurred to me that we would not capture the escapees. I felt confident we would. Uh, it, it did occur to me that it would be an absolute miracle if we did so without any great harm coming to uh, some innocent citizen. A full-scale manhunt is in effect. Officers from all over the state are dispatched. Roadblocks and barricades are set up. Helicopters with infrared sensors try to pick up the heat of human bodies hiding in the woods. Police know the longer the killers run free, the harder they will be to recapture. Letner tours C-Pod, where the inmates were housed. Officers conduct a search of each cell. They find no clues to where the escapees might be heading but they do find some makeshift weapons. The inmates were very clever in both manufacturing and concealing weapons in their cells. One search that we conducted revealed a table leg that had been used to conceal a hacksaw blade, uh, one shank, and some other contraband. The inmates have been out for over an hour, and investigators know they are armed with knives. And since they had access to guards' protective riot gear, they fear they might have guns. 
the state mobilizes every possible resource to capture the fugitives. A death sentence already hangs over each of the escapees. These men have nothing to lose. Officers comb the perimeter, searching for any sign of the killer's trail. They find nothing. They're going north. I'm, I'm assuming they took nine. With no clues outside the prison, Letner hopes the guards can tell him where the inmates have gone. Perhaps during the breakout, they heard something that could help direct the search. The inmates never spoke of where they were headed. The guards know nothing. The guards' lack of information makes Letner suspect they may have helped the prisoners escape. From his years of experience as an investigator for the state police at other prison incidents, Letner knows that prison guards can be susceptible to bribes. In 1984, Virginia prison guards had a starting salary of under $13,000. Even college campus police were paid more. Guards complained they were often assaulted by the inmates. The intimidation and low pay affected their morale. First of all, let me say this to everyone. As Letner begins interviewing the security staff, he learns tensions at Mecklenburg have been rising for the past two years since the execution of Frank Coppola. Convicted of beating a woman to death in a robbery, Frank Coppola steadfastly maintained his innocence. But after being on death row for five years, he stopped his appeal and asked the court to execute him. Coppola's execution signaled a controversial change in attitude. He was the first man in Virginia to face the electric chair since the death penalty had been reinstated six years earlier. When Coppola was executed, something went terribly wrong. His head and one of his legs caught fire. Human rights advocates accused prison officials of torturing him. And so, among the inmates, Coppola became a martyr. Frank J. Coppola was executed at 1127 p.m. in the manner prescribed by law. Fears had been growing among the death row inmates. Fears the state would embark on a rash of executions. Author Joe Jackson. When Coppola was executed, I think that the other death row prisoners started to see that, that they too could be executed. Beforehand, appeals had dragged on. All of a sudden, here's this guy that, that all of the other death row prisoners look up to, and he's the first to go. And at that point, the other death row prisoners said, this could happen to me fairly quickly. Two months before the breakout, an inmate on death row sent an anonymous tip to the state assistant attorney general. All right, let's get this place started fast. You want to get done According to the informant, a bomb was being constructed as part of an escape plan. The scheme also involved an exchange of uniforms with the guards. This information was relayed to the warden, who ordered two shakedowns. Officers methodically searched every cell on death row, but found no bomb-making materials or anything to indicate a bomb was being constructed. 
Jim Lettner finds it difficult to believe the guards were ignorant of the plan. He suspects one of them may have actively aided in the escape. An escape freeing six of Virginia's most dangerous men. Over an hour after the escape, police in Western Virginia mobilize and search the area around Mecklenburg's prison in a hunt for six escaped killers. As the minutes tick away, they struggle to maintain their search perimeter. Police begin to fear that if the escaped killers slip beyond the perimeter, innocent people might die. But it is so important that you remember every single detail, no matter how unimportant it may seem to you. Inside the prison, James Lettner questions the guards, fearing one of them helped the inmates escape. Everyone else remained. And Desperate to find bit, any clue as to night. how the breakout occurred and where these dangerous men might be, he calls each officer to account for his actions. As Lettner questions the guards, he begins to understand how the escape unfolded. Five guards stand watch as the condemned men of Seapod take their daily exercise. That's me. Whoop. Willie Turner and another inmate approach an officer, telling him they want to go back in early. One of the men claims he has a knee injury. The other says he wants to use the restroom. This is against prison policy. State police investigator James Lettner. It was a mistake to allow those two individuals to go back separately from the others. If one inmate went back, then they all were supposed to go back. And the reason for that is that by taking those two inmates back early, it took two of the correctional officers off the recreation yard and back to the cell area, lessening the number of eyes that were available to watch the remaining inmates as they returned from recreation to their cells. Now the ratio of guards to prisoners is disrupted. In the yard, there are only three officers left to watch over the remaining inmates. All right, guys, let's do it. Time to go in. Let's do it. Let's do it. Come on, come on, come on. The other inmates are escorted to their cells. The guards seem unconcerned they are outnumbered three to one. The correctional officers assumed that nothing was going to happen, that, that everything was fine, that they had a, a secure operation, and that they, they simply didn't have to follow these rules. Had they been more vigilant, they would have noticed a plan is already in motion. A plan whose success or failure depends on one man, Earl Clanton. The plan also relies on the guards' complacency. They do not bother to count heads. The inmates bunch up and start to push, distracting the officers. Unnoticed, Clanton slips into the guard's restroom. His job, to wait for a signal. A ruthless killer, Clanton was chosen as the man to make the first strike. In 1980, he stabbed an elementary school librarian eight times in the head. He then took the belt from her coat and strangled her to death. Because they didn't count heads, the guards have no idea Clanton has disappeared. Lettner's report would later indicate this was a breach of security protocol. It's difficult to believe that when you're dealing with individuals who have 
everyone murdered at least one person and in some instances multiple murders that the correctional officers would become complacent and feel that they didn't have to count these individuals or, or know where they were at every moment. It's difficult to believe that that would occur, but it did in this instance. The guards escort the inmates back to the day room. They never notice one of them is missing. A guard tries the restroom door, but it's locked. The locked door locked. should have sent up red warning flags. Uh, In such a situation, see. prison policy dictates they should call maintenance and all inmates be placed in their cells. But the guards don't do that. Police are beginning to panic. It has been nearly two hours and the fugitives have not been spotted. The officers are now working a wide perimeter. They know the larger the perimeter, the easier it is for the inmates to slip past them. Police are on the lookout for the van used in the escape, but have no idea which direction to search. Warden, could I uh, talk to you? James Lettner continues his investigation by questioning nurse Rose Clark. It is customary for Nurse Clark to draw the water from the guard's restroom before she distributes the inmate's medication. Unbeknownst to her, this is where Earl Clanton is now hiding. Door's the restroom door appears stuck. Nurse Clark notifies the guard. He acknowledges the problem, but does nothing. Boys lined up for medication. All right, everybody in the Let's room. Let's go, gentlemen. Nurse Clark decides to distribute the medication without water, as she has done in the past. As she is making her rounds, one of them complains his toilet is clogged. He creates a diversion, distracting the guards from what is really going on. Officer Hunter joins Nurse Clark as she continues making her medication rounds to the other pods in the building. The escapees were con artists. They, they were shrewd in the, in the ways of the street and, and how they could get around uh, uh, these correctional officers. They had observed from, from the moment that they entered the institution that certain rules were not being followed and it played right into their hands. At Mecklenburg, building one is broken up into three pods, A, B, and C. C pod is divided into two sections with a control booth separating the sections. Certainly. Officer Hughes, please. The man who controlled C-Pod was Rick Hughes. Electrically activated locks give Officer Hughes control over who enters and leaves death row. Hughes tells Lettner that one of the inmates got his attention. It was Joe Giarratano, who was housed on the pod's left side. Giarratano asks Hughes to pass a book to inmate James Briley, who was on the pod's right side. All right, I'll, I'll do it this time. Come on, come on. Linwood Briley and his brother James received death sentences for seven murders. 
In one case, they repeatedly raped a woman within earshot of her common-law husband and their five-year-old son, then killed the three of them. Officer Hughes leaves the door to the control booth ajar, as the prisoners had seen him do dozens of times before. He has no idea the inmates are already arming themselves with knives. There was a fellow by the name of Willie Turner. He was kind of a genius as far as figuring out how to make weapons from the things around him in the prison cell and how to hide them. And he would basically strip metal from around the toilets or the sides of the door or something like that and, um, and sharpen it and make a knife out of it. Convicted of killing a jeweler in 1978 and sentenced to death, Willie Turner never finished fifth grade, but he learned to read and write in prison. He claimed to have made a key for every cell he ever occupied. The guards suspect he is behind the plan to escape. James Briley's signal, Clanton bursts from the restroom. He hits a button on the control booth, releasing the other inmates. The prisoners take control of C Pod in barely three minutes. Each of the guards relate how he had been taken hostage and stripped of his uniform. The inmates take the only defense the guards have, their nightsticks, along with their watches, rings, and money. The guards are hogtied and shackled with their own handcuffs. Blindfolded, they overhear the inmates discuss how they need to capture someone in authority. He's one at a time. Everyone else just relax. The senior officer is watch commander, Lieutenant Mark Johnson. Reconstruct the events the very first time you were done. I got radio call. Letner's report indicates he was in building three when he responded to a page. Building 3, located on the opposite side of Mecklenburg, houses the shipping department. Lieutenant Johnson, please call 161. Lieutenant Johnson, 161. Lieutenant Johnson is asked to call the extension of the Seapod day room. The phone is answered by one of the guards held hostage. Lieutenant Johnson has no idea the guard is being held at knife point. Seapod left, need you right away. The guard tells Johnson he needs right, help with up. inmate Jaritano, who he says has been wounded in an altercation. Lieutenant Fisher, Lieutenant Johnson, come in, please. Johnson calls the shift commander and orders him to report to CPOD. So the key is just to ignore them. You know? Don't pay any attention to them. Nurse Clark finishes passing out her medication to the rest of the inmates in Building 1. The exit is through this locked door. Unfortunately, Officer Hunter has misplaced his key. He decides to return to Seapod, unaware it is now in control of the inmates. Hunter walks right into their arms. Hunter is taken down to the pod's lower tier, where he joins the other hostages. The conspirators need his uniform. They force Hunter to strip to his underwear, then blindfold and hogtie him. 
The inmates know the security procedures, and they make the system work against itself. They got the other guards to come to Pod C simply by faking emergencies uh, uh, that they needed assistance with inmate so-and-so who was uh, not uh, taking his medication or resisting one thing or another. By creating the illusion of a fellow correctional officer in trouble, the inmates lure other guards into C-Pod one by one. They then capture them and take their uniforms. Nurse Clark is beginning to wonder what is keeping Officer Hunter. When a guard finally arrives, she is relieved. She has no idea her terrifying ordeal is just beginning. In Western Virginia, six convicted killers have escaped from death row and have been on the loose for over two hours. Investigators have no leads to their whereabouts. Police are frantically searching a wide perimeter. Using every resource available, they struggle to maintain it, desperate to contain the inmates. Virginia State Police Investigator Jim Lettner continues gathering information for his report by interrogating the prison security staff, hoping they will provide some leads to where the escaped inmates are headed. Each officer recounts his terrifying ordeal. One by one, they are taken hostage. The inmates use their uniforms as a disguise to lure more officers into the trap. The guards tell Lettner James Briley wanted to kill some hostages. I think we we'll wanted to kill a few of them. There were too many, Briley said. He was afraid they would become unmanageable. Willie Turner, one of the inmates, talks Briley out of it. They had agreed there would be no murders. Derek Peterson returns with Nurse Clark. They take her to a cell. Nurse Clark is alone when Earl Clanton appears. Clanton had been convicted of killing two women, and now he has his eyes on Nurse Clark. Surrounded by convicted killers bent on freedom or revenge, the security staff doubts they will live to see mourning. The screams of Nurse Clark stir them to anger, but they can do nothing. Linwood Briley joins Earl Clanton. As they begin to molest the nurse, Wilbert Lee Evans stops the men. Willie Turner reminds Linwood to remember the plan. It has been 20 minutes since Lieutenant Johnson received a report about an emergency on death row. He begins to wonder what is happening in C-Pod. He sent the shift commander to help out, but he never reported back. Johnson investigates the situation himself. The stairwell doors lock automatically behind him. Get the jacket! Come here! It's time for your shaking! 
the inmates threaten to kill Johnson if he does not do as they order. Once the inmates no longer have any use for them, the hostages fear they will all be killed. It has been three hours since the escape, and still there have been no sightings of the fugitives. Authorities begin to fear they've slipped the search perimeter. If that is true, a lot of innocent people are in danger. As the prison guards continue their account, Jim Lettner still hopes to find one detail that will lead him to the killers. And, uh, got a radio. In the main control room, Officer Cindy Smith had word that an inmate was injured, but no one had called the paramedics. During the past hour, several officers and supervisors had gone up to death row. None had reported back. Officer Smith begins to worry. Main control room, Officer Smith. The inmates on death row have taken all the guards and CPOD hostage. Having all the uniforms and money they need, it is time to make good their escape and get out of building one. They move the hostages to a janitor's closet at the end of CPOD. James Briley grabs a television set. Somehow he would have to pass it off as a bomb. Now that the inmates have control of CPOD, they have to get out of the building. At the center of building one is a main control room which controls the door to the outside. The inmates have to gain control of this room. In the main control room, Officer Smith is still waiting word from the officers dispatched to CPOD. Officer Smith. Then she receives a call. It sounds like Lieutenant Johnson. He tells her a man is being sent to relieve her. Bye having her supervisor, who was a hostage, call her and tell her that she would be relieved of duty by another guard. She didn't question who the guard was. Peterson and Clanton, now dressed in guards' uniforms, head for the main control room. Officer Smith has no way of knowing the officer sent to relieve her is Derek Peterson. The prisoners now have control of all the doors to building one. But there is only one way out of the prison compound, the sally port. James Briley forces Lieutenant Johnson to call for a van. We got a bomb in building one. We need both vehicle sally ports open. He claims they have an emergency. The van must be brought around to the main sally port. I'll stay back here with the doors for you. Willie Turner has an appeal pending and volunteers to stay behind and guard the hostages. In the CPOD control booth, Joe Giarratano, who also stays behind, pushes a button, opening the stairwell door. The rest of the conspirators, disguised as guards, troop downstairs to the loading dock. Lieutenant Johnson is no longer needed, and so the watch commander is imprisoned in the Building 1 stairwell. They leave behind one of their own in the control booth to open the door and let them out of building one. They lock Officer Smith in a closet. 
On their way out, the six escapees raid the room full of riot gear. Wearing helmets to further hide their identities, they place the television on a stretcher, throw a blanket over it, and exit building one. For months prior to the breakout, the inmates leaked a story about a bomb being built in Seapod. So when James Briley warns the officer in charge of the van that they have a live explosive device and it might go off, the terrified officer completely believes him. Linwood Briley sprays their bogus bomb with a fire extinguisher and it appears to be smoking. Escape has taken less than two hours to execute. And now, six vicious killers are roaming free. It has been over three hours since Virginia prison officials were awakened by terrifying news. Six death row inmates have broken out of Mecklenburg Correctional Center, a state-of-the-art escape-proof facility. All police have is a widening search and no leads. James Lettner reports that none of the guards conspired in the escape. They are guilty only of errors in judgment. Each error by itself would not have been enough, but taken together, they enabled six condemned men to escape. The most pressing question on Lettner's mind is where the killers are headed. Between them, the six escapees have been convicted of killing 17 persons. They've been in and out of prison most of their lives. And now, they are free men. Officer Lawrence Harrison of the Warren County, North Carolina Sheriff's Department, on patrol far outside the Virginia Authority's search perimeter, notices a white prison van. At the time, I thought it was just correctional people transferred because they do that at night. And they came by, they waited me, and I waited them, and they kept going. The prisoners have slipped the perimeter, and Officer Harrison has not yet been informed of the breakout. The escapees realize a white prison van would be easily spotted. As their euphoria from the escape wears off, they begin arguing about where they should go, what they should do with the van. Someone suggests they hide the van in the woods and cover it with branches. But that would take time, and the six are getting nervous. While driving through Warrenton, North Carolina, a town of about 1,000 people, they find a grove of trees. It looks like a good place to leave the van. The escapees split up. The Briley's, Tuggle, and Jones go one direction. Clanton and Peterson go another. The men get lucky, finding some sweat clothes hanging outside on a clothesline. They ditch their prison garb. While police continue to search the perimeter around the prison, the inmates are running free to the south of their search area.
The fugitives have been on the run for three and a half hours when a North Carolina Highway Patrol officer discovers the prison van. 211 Central, I'm stopping to check out a suspicious van in the back of the schoolyard. It's 30 miles from Mecklenburg. It had been driven into some trees behind the Marion Boyd Elementary School. Parked near the playground, the van is hardly inconspicuous. Officers from the Warrenton Police and Sheriff's Department approach the prison van. Investigators find the riot gear the prisoners used to disguise themselves, along with a television set they passed off as a bomb. Unfortunately, they find nothing to indicate which direction the escapees are heading. The riot gear can furnish a scent for the bloodhounds. Certainly, certainly. We called around. We're going to call around a certain area. Okay. Yes, excuse me, sir. I think we might have a break. Back at the prison, Letner gets word a hospital orderly had been carjacked at knife point by two men in uniform. Letner suspects these were two of the escapees. The orderly is lucky to have escaped with his life. When investigators examine his car, they find a prison shank similar to those used in the escape in the back seat. Police know the men have now split up and two of them are on foot. The Virginia State Police, prison emergency teams and the North Carolina Highway Patrol take over a motel and set up a command post. Because the fugitives have crossed state lines, the FBI is called in. Special Agent James Trotter is awakened in the middle of the night. The phone rang, my wife answered it, uh, handed the phone to me. It was Wayne Waddell, an agent down uh, uh, in Danville, Virginia, which covered the prison at Mecklenburg. Uh, Wayne said something like, uh, uh, Jimmy, uh, I got a problem. We got a problem. Uh, uh, six guys have broken out of death row here. The fact the escapees split up would make them harder to find. But if they were on foot, they couldn't go far. Investigators adjust their search perimeter, vectoring in the location and time the van had been abandoned with the location and time of the attempted carjacking. Uh, it's just a matter of connecting the dots. You know, going from point A to point B and uh, seeing how far ahead of you they are and, and uh, trying to outsmart them and uh, beat them to the next uh, place they're likely to go and uh, be there waiting for them. Representatives of various law enforcement agencies meet to set up a task force. Right. Coordinating the search is Robert Pence, special agent in charge of the Charlotte FBI office. Because of the magnitude of this incident, the response from law enforcement, I would say, was massive. We had every FBI agent in the eastern part of the state, along with support that we sent from the headquarters in Charlotte. We, had, uh, we used aircraft, we used uh, dogs, we used uh, corrections officers. In other words, it was a door-to-door -door search, it was a field-type search, and while all this was going on, communications were being sent to enlarge the search uh, to prepare the rest of the sector and the rest of the country to uh, be aware of these people and, and be alert for them. County. Special Agent Pence needs more information. The names and addresses of their next of kin, records of telephone calls they had made, the identities of persons with whom they were authorized to communicate. Well, what we did simultaneously was search records to try to identify associates, relatives, neighbors, anyone who these individuals might have tried to contact if they got out of the Warrenton area. 
police set up a tip line. Pence dispatches agents to interview the fugitive's friends and family. Not just to gather information, but to warn them that the killers are on the loose. We believed that they were still in the area. I mean, we had no indication that they had left. So the perimeter was kept tight and we kept looking for them. But thoughts or feelings creep into you that uh, perhaps they did escape. Then what the police fear most happens. A man reports his truck stolen. The truck, a five-year-old Ford Ranger, was serviced the day before and is full of gas. Within moments, officials from the Department of Corrections, the Highway Patrol, Sheriff's deputies, and the local police swarm over the property, searching for any clue that might have been left behind. The man tells investigators his truck would be easy to identify. It has personalized license tags with the letters P-E-I-1. Police order an all points bulletin put out for the pickup. Investigators can't be sure whether the killers had all fled in the truck or whether some stayed behind, lurking in the backyards of Warrington. Special Agent Pence. So initially it was to try to contain them, and then it became a national search. So while all this was going on, while the physical search was going on, communications would be sent advising the rest of the country about what happened here, that we had the largest breakout of death row inmates in U.S. history, and we needed to apprehend them very quickly. The new perimeter has just been shattered. Now that the escapees have a vehicle, the search area extends for hundreds of miles up the East Coast. As dawn breaks the day after the escape, police set up a fortified perimeter around Warrington, North Carolina. Roadblocks are established, and every driver is questioned. Search teams are organized. Every available law enforcement officer is recruited. Police bring in tracking dogs to follow the escapee's scent. Starting in the area immediately around the van, a pattern search fans out like ripples in a pond, covering an ever wider area, requiring more and more manpower. Police comb the woods and search outbuildings, anywhere the escapees might hide. After several hours of searching, the investigators know only that the fugitives had split up. Some of them may have stolen a truck, but police were no closer to finding them than when they started. This morning, the residents of Warrington, North Carolina, wake up to see helicopter shots of their town on the national news. At the prison, officials attempt to answer the questions of a frightened public. At this point in time, our uh, primary concern is the uh, recapture uh, of the inmates who are at large at this point. And we are cooperating with uh, the FBI, with North Carolina, uh, with uh, a number of other uh, authorities uh, in an effort to do that. Fred Patton, District First Sergeant in the North Carolina Highway Patrol. You could all but chart it like a fog bank as the fear rolled across the four counties from Warrington outward. And as the sightings increased, people became more frightened. 
the fact that they were in their midst, six people that had killed 17 folks had murdered them, including a five-year-old child. And it, among their rapes was a 76-year-old woman. They began to arm themselves. Warrenton residents scrambled to buy weapons and ammunition. Citizens are terrified to learn six desperate killers are loose in their community. Virginian pilot reporter Tony Geronmata. There was a lot of tension, a lot of fear. I remember people talking, saying they had their guns, and you know, if anybody came on their step, they would shoot them. Uh, talked to some of the merchants in this little town. Apparently, got cleaned out of guns, and there was no ammunition to be to be bought. Residents barricade themselves in their homes. Aware the fugitives have disguised themselves as guards, they are wary of police officers and answer their doors with weapons in hand. Special Agent Robert Pence. And we had a lot of fear in the neighborhood of Warrington where they were supposedly or possibly still contained. People were, uh, were extremely uh, afraid and scared and people were going around door to door making announcements that lock your doors, lock your cars. Uh, a lot of people didn't sleep there for a few nights. 300 sheriff's deputies, state troopers, and highway patrol officers join in the search, hoping to ease the public's fears. Warren County Sheriff's Deputy Lawrence Harrison. At that time, with debit is what few we had. We made deliveries for the old ladies that would call up to the grocery store want some, we would pick it up and carry it to them because they were scared to come out. How many people are in the search stuff? right now? I don't know the numbers. The media the clamors for any information about the investigation. How many sightings have you had total that you know of? Well, um, there have been some confirmed and some unconfirmed. So and how many confirmed? Uh, at this time we have two confirmed. Anything on the, pickup the anxious public wants to know where the fugitives might be. What was the time that they're laying time? low until dark? Well, that, that's a possibility. Is that Certainly something that it's easier to move uh, and not be uh, detected after dark. So. What do you do in that case? Earl Clanton and Derek Peterson traded the guards' uniforms for some sweat clothes. Clanton kept his guard's jacket but ripped off the patches. The two fugitives walk into a coin-operated laundry. Having spent a sleepless night on the run, they are hungry and thirsty. They had just been to a convenience store where they bought a bottle of wine and some cheese. The commander of the prison emergency response team, or PERT, happens to be driving by the laundry. He spots a man wearing a coat. The coat is the same color and cut as a Mecklenburg guard's uniform. Certain this is one of the escaped inmates, the officer decides to arrest him before he can leave the laundry. He hopes to catch him by surprise. Ma'am, get out! Get out! Go! Go! Hey! Let me see your hands! Turn around! Get your hands up! Clanton and Peterson were out of prison for no more than 19 hours. They didn't go far. And now their freedom is over. The two men concede they expected to be caught because they were lost. Turns out it was a convenient place to be arrested. The coin-operated laundry is only a half block from the county jail. They found two of them there. They thought maybe the rest of them would be there. So if we had fear before when the van was discovered, we had a tremendous amount of fear whenever two of them were apprehended right in town. So during the, that early two or three days, uh, the mood was, uh, was very serious and the people were very concerned, very scared. We knew at that point it was going to be a complicated search because they weren't all looking out for each other and they weren't together. 
and maybe two of them were a little more half-hearted in this escape. And now we had to find the ones that uh, really intended to go the route and, and where they were going. Investigators debate the possible whereabouts of the other four escapees. To Special Agent Trotter, the Briley brothers are at the top of their list. The Briley brothers killed repeatedly for no apparent reason. They killed women, they killed pregnant women, they killed little children, they killed grown men. Uh, and they killed in very brutal and grisly ways and apparently had absolutely no remorse for any of the crimes for which they were convicted. Trotter fears that unlike Peterson and Clanton, the Briley brothers won't give up without a fight. Police are in a desperate race against time today to find four killers who they fear may kill again. The capture of two escapees in the town of Warrington, North Carolina, only intensifies the sense of fear in the region. On the second day of the search, police scour a North Carolina campground after a woman reports she saw two of the convicts jogging across a field. Officers fan out through the woods, emerging hours later with nothing but a cold trail. Sightings of the escaped death row inmates are coming in from throughout North Carolina and Virginia. Each call has to be checked out. Fred Patton, District First Sergeant in the North Carolina Highway Patrol. It was like the dam breaking. First of all, there was a drip, and, and then there was a, a minor uh, uh, fluctuation of calls that we would receive as far as sightings were concerned. And then the dam broke, and sightings were coming in by the hundreds. And of course, by that time, we had mobilized enough people and had them spread out to, to the point that we could respond to the sightings within a short period of time. And that this is what we wanted to do. Investigators suspect the escapees may have left the area, but they cannot be sure. The manhunt continues in and around Warrington. Well, these fellows are very smart. They know what they're doing, obviously. And they could be dug in anywhere, and they gotta turn every limb and every tree. Helicopters search the dense forests and red dirt fields on the North Carolina-Virginia border. Police patrol the waterways in abandoned houses and stop traffic along all roads and highways looking for four dangerous men. Police continue to get tips. Special Agent Robert Pence. So a lot of those tips were, were scare tips, they were fear tips, they weren't uh, helping a lot. And I don't believe that uh, any of the calls really materialize as far as uh, giving us direction about where these fugitives might be. But I, did, I do think it gave the citizens a conduit to, to really vent some of their uh, fears and uh, concerns. A manhunt sweeps the forests and swamps. All day long they search, growing more miserable by the hour. They run out of insect repellent in Warrington and have to send out for more. The officers endure difficult conditions, all to no avail. Officer Lawrence Harrison responds to several sightings of the fugitives. Everybody in the whole county has seen them once we get there. And I don't know how many bloodhounds we didn't have here. They would say, I saw him run across the road down here. We take the bloodhounds down there, tearing out nothing. And and they said, I saw him run down there. We take the bloodhounds down there, and sometimes we probably running them guys. We did see some guys run across the road, but it wasn't the Briley brothers coming from the liquor store and the marijuana patch. Reports pour in as residents throughout Virginia and North Carolina call police hotlines 
claiming to have seen the fugitives. The governor of Virginia posts a $40,000 reward for information leading to the fugitives' capture. Sightings come in from North Carolina and Virginia. Every call has to be checked out, but leads nowhere. Thinking the Briley's might return to their old neighborhood, Richmond, Virginia, police interview their acquaintances and former gang members. Special Agent James Trotter. These guys uh, just killed uh, to, to see people die. Uh, just to be killing. And I think that's why the Richmond community, upon learning that they uh, had escaped, uh, particularly the areas uh, of Richmond, uh, which they frequented uh, uh, in the past, the people were terrified. Their own parents were terrified, not for them, but of them. In Portsmouth, Virginia, just a few hours' drive from Warrington, a police officer spots two men breaking into a car. Hey, police, what are y'all doing? See some hands. See some y'all. Let me see your hands. Step back from behind the car. Step back from behind the car. Let me see your hands. Good, good. When he tries to stop them, the two men open fire. Uh, saw Linwood Briley in the 1800 block of Elm Avenue, but then he lost sight of him. And shortly before 9 o'clock, another officer spotted Linwood Briley and James Briley here at Elm and Lincoln. Apparently they were tampering or appeared to be tampering with an automobile in this area. As soon as they saw the officers, they ran. As fears spread, the sightings keep coming in from far and wide. If the escapees did steal a pickup truck, they could be anywhere. The missing vehicle had enough fuel to get past Richmond. Hey, yeah, he's right up there. On a hunch the fugitives might head north, Agents begin interviewing gas station attendants just north of Virginia's capital. One attendant remembers seeing a pickup truck with one white man and three black men. Investigator Jim Letter. I was absolutely convinced that at least two of them, and perhaps four of them, were capable of, of murder or any other uh, crime uh, and, and would eventually commit other murders if they remained uh, on the street. Having lost their perimeter, investigators scramble for clues to where the fugitives might be headed. They focus their attention on the leaders of the gang. They begin by examining a log of phone calls made from death row. The log indicates the Briley brothers made a number of calls to the Philadelphia area. The log entries lead agents to one wrong address after another. They begin to suspect the Briley's entered false phone numbers. Michael Carbonell is a supervisory special agent with the FBI in Philadelphia. Based upon all the negative investigation we had conducted, I felt that those numbers were not right. In other words, they were not telling the guard which number they were actually calling. Investigators subpoenaed the toll records corresponding to the phone on death row. When they compare it to the handwritten log, their suspicions are confirmed. The phone company's records show the actual numbers the Briley's called. Agents now have over 50 good numbers to investigate. Well, okay. The only other thing we had was maybe mail.
Two of the calls had been placed to a house in North Philadelphia. Investigators know from prison visitation records that the Briley's have an uncle who lives in North Philly. Carbonell set up to trace their uncle's outgoing calls. I didn't think that the Briley brothers would be staying with him, and I didn't want to hit his house until we were absolutely sure that they were here. The time was on our side at that point, so we decided to put a surveillance on his residence, and, and we conducted that surveillance for probably four or five days. The FBI watches the Briley's uncle's every move. Although they never see him with the Briley's, the agents have no choice but to wait it out. As the FBI chases every lead on the fugitives from Mecklenburg's death row, they get another break hundreds of miles from Virginia. Lem Tuggle and Willie Jones took eight days to make their way to Woodford, Vermont, a little resort town just south of the Canadian border. The men had spent the night in the woods. They decide to try and make it to Canada. The two fugitives have a problem. Their stolen truck is low on gas and they need money. Tuggle leaves Jones and drives back to a souvenir shop he had visited three days before. Oh, hiya. Diet Coke. Gotcha. Waiting for the right time to make his move, Tuggle asks the owner for a soda. And there will be anything else for you, sir? Yes, ma'am. Drawing a hunting knife, he demands all the money in the cash register. Once Tuggle gets the money, he turns and walks out. The woman notes the truck's license tag, PEI-1. It is easy to remember. The take is about $80 and change. It isn't much, but it's enough for gas and a new start in Canada. Unfortunately for Tuggle, he is heading in the wrong direction. Ronald Wunderlich has just woken up and is about to head off for an all-night job guarding a nuclear power station. When he hears the report of a robbery at the Woodford gift shop, Wunderlich is a constable in a town of only 300 people. His Ford Escort doubles as his patrol car. In Stamford, Vermont, it seems unlikely he'll have to engage in any high-speed chases. Trooper Daniel Begeving also hears the report. The dispatcher says that the suspect was last seen driving east on Route 9. And the dispatch advised that upon running a registration check on the motor vehicle, they had discovered that it was a stolen vehicle suspected involved with escapees from the Mecklenburg area. Begee being accelerates to intercept the vehicle. Wunderlich is driving out of Stamford when he spots the suspect vehicle, coming right at him on the wrong side of the road. The constable whips his Ford Escort into a U-turn and begins a pursuit. Author Joe Jackson. Most of the town constable that ever really done before was to like hustle drunks off the street and check out um, reports of stolen bicycles. And all of a sudden he was he was chasing this this crazy man who had robbed um, robbed a store at Knife Point. Wunderlich radios Begeebing that the truck is now heading south toward the state of Massachusetts. Trooper Begeebing goes from a code two to a code three response using his lights and siren. I 
I was accelerating around uh, probably 80 or 90 miles an hour to try to try to meet them to make up some time and distance before he got north to the intersection of Route 100 and Route 8. If they act quickly, they can set up a roadblock before the convict has a chance to slip away. On the radio, the Giebing hears that other officers are joining the chase. Wunderlich advises him that the vehicle has turned around and is proceeding north on Route 100. The trooper and the fugitive are now heading straight for each other. At that time, I was trying to find a good location to execute a stop where there weren't any residences around, uh, where we could have something of relative safety, yet still be in enough of a field of view where I could see the truck coming. The officers now realize they are pursuing a convicted killer. When Begibing swings his vehicle across the road, he knows he is putting his life on the line in a high-stakes game of dare. There's a little element of danger involved, uh, but yet it's something that being a, a rural patrol officer, you rarely see, and you're kind of like saying, oh no, to yourself, you know, that what have I gotten myself into here? Begibing is gambling that the suspect isn't desperate enough to ram his cruiser, or that he is a good enough shot to stop him before he does. A Vermont state trooper and a town constable have boxed in one of the death row escapees. It's now a question of whether Lem Tuggle, who had been convicted of killing two persons, would be squeamish about killing a third. Weighing his options, Tuggle pulls over and stops. I then ordered him to place his hands out the window so I could see his hands. And we then ordered Tuggle from the truck to lay down on the pavement and then approached him and took him into custody. He identified himself to me as, you know, my name is Lem and I'm from Virginia. And something to the effect, I expect you'll find that I'm wanted. Lem Tuggle has been a fugitive for just 10 days. Come give me a hand. He seems almost relieved to be captured. Tuggle admits that robbing the gift shop was a big mistake. But the truck was out of gas and he wanted to get to Canada. The next day, an unusual call comes in to the Vermont State Police. State Police, do the man gives the dispatcher his name. Louis Jones? Yes, can I help you? He says police are looking for him. For what? Where? He'd escaped from prison. I can't. Mecklenburg? M Mecklenburg where? In Virginia? For what? He had broken out of death row. How long? When? and you want to turn yourself in. I will be sending uh, the cruiser up, the police up to um, talk with you. When Tuggle didn't return, Jones became lost and confused. Tired of being on the run, he wanted to turn himself in. The dispatcher asks Jones to describe where he is. She determines that he is on Route 242 outside the town of Jay. Jones tells the dispatcher he is unarmed. In his 26 years as a trooper, this is the only time Richard Armitage has ever had a fugitive call and asked to be picked up. He just looked like he was ready to, to turn himself in. He, he, he looked dejected, he looked tired, dirty, hungry. And it was obvious that he'd been bit by a number of, of the black flies that we do have in this area. And it was really, it was like the, the weight of the world had been taken off his shoulders. He was so glad that he was going where he could get something to eat and something to drink. It wouldn't have been difficult for Jones to enter Canada. In Vermont, the border is only guarded at the highways. 
If he knew where he was going, he could have easily just walked across. But Jones gave himself up just five miles from the Canadian border. Author Joe Jackson believes Jones may have been overwhelmed by his newfound freedom. They live most of their adult lives in prison. I mean, prison is their world, and so they're able to figure out how the prison world acts, but they don't, they're not able to figure out how the free world acts. They fit in the prison world. They don't fit in the free world. With four of the six fugitives captured, only the Brileys, the most dangerous killers, remain at large. With their well-known history of vicious murders, the two remaining fugitives seem to be everywhere. Sightings come in from as far north as Montreal, in Richmond, Virginia, where the brothers went on their bloody rampage, everyone locks their doors. A manhunt is organized in Oxford, North Carolina, after a man thought to be Linwood Briley steals some cans of food from a convenience store. In Richmond, Virginia, the family of a former gang member who turned state's evidence against the Briley's is given police protection. Investigators question Lem Tuggle for clues to the Briley's whereabouts. Tuggle tells police how the escapees wandered through Warrington looking for a vehicle they could steal. They hotwired a pickup truck and took off. Tuggle tells them the Briley's had never been in Portsmouth or Richmond. He says they didn't kill anyone while he was with them. After stealing the pickup truck in North Carolina, they drove north to Philadelphia. They burned the guards' uniforms in a trash can. According to Tuggle, the Briley's claimed they arranged for someone to meet them with clothes and a gun. Tuggle further recalls that James Briley stuck one of the guards' badges into a tree in Philadelphia's hunting park. He and Jones then headed north towards the Canadian border. Tuggle claims they even stopped and asked two state troopers for directions to the New Jersey Turnpike. There they were, driving along, two escaped convicts from a maximum security prison. Wanted by the FBI and law enforcement agencies in several states. But apparently no one noticed them. Tuggle says he and Jones eventually parted company at a campground when he left to rob the gift shop. Special Agent Mike Carbonell comes to Philadelphia with a map of the park drawn by Tuggle. I uh, frankly didn't believe it. I'm familiar with Hunting Park. When I looked at the map, there were no tennis courts drawn on the map. I was skeptical. I felt, why would a guy who's on death row, who's going to be executed, cooperate with us? Searching the trees, investigators find the guard's badge. This confirms Tuggle's story. I was, I was stunned. I didn't, I didn't believe it. But the proof is in the pudding. The badge was there, and then we knew that uh, they were here. The FBI knows the Briley's have an uncle in Philadelphia. They believe the two fugitives will probably contact him if they haven't done so already. Special Agent James Trotter. They set up a surveillance and sat there for days, nothing. Uh, he would call me and report. He would say, the guy's not doing anything. Nobody's coming or going. Agents get a break when they shadow the uncle to a body shop specializing in upholstery and vinyl car tops.
Days earlier, a woman in New York notified police she received a call from James Briley. The call originated from this garage. Its owner, Dan Latham, had been introduced to the Brileys by their uncle using false names. He called them Lucky and Slim. The FBI sets up a fixed surveillance on Latham's garage. Agents see several men hanging around, but aren't sure if they're the Brileys. They send in an informant from the neighborhood to try and confirm an ID. Uh, he was a street type guy who was very sharp, uh, could really uh, maneuver in that environment. Uh, we sent him in there. He actually talked to James Briley. He came back out, met with us. He said, I think it's him. A tattoo on the suspect's left arm further confirms the ID. Agents believe they have found James, but they see no sign of his brother Linwood. They wonder whether to go in and arrest one or wait with the hope of getting both. But if they wait, Virginia's most notorious serial killers might slip away. After 19 days of searching, the FBI believes they have located the last two escapees from Mecklenburg's death row. They have taken refuge at a body shop in North Philadelphia. The two fugitives appear to be having a party, having confirmed their identities through an informant. Agents decide it's time to move in. Garage owner Dan Latham is surprised by all the commotion. I myself was in the office on the phone, just taking it easy, and I heard some wheels screeching, coming to a halt, and I heard a lot of screaming. Uh, I looked outside, all I seen was guns, a lot of guns. Both brothers admit their identities and are led away in handcuffs. The nationwide manhunt is over. The last of the Mecklenburg Six are recaptured. They had been free for 19 days. For Sergeant Fred Patton, it is the end of a nightmare. When the, the Briley brothers were finally apprehended in Philadelphia, it was like uh, the weight of the world had been lifted off of you because I reiterate that these were bad folks. Uh, these were killers. The Briley brothers, who are facing death sentences in Virginia, were picked up at a car shop on Philadelphia's north side. FBI agent John Hogan says they were surprised when 20 agents surrounded them. They were apprehended without incident. They caused no problem to us. They have both admitted their identity. They have the appropriate scars and marks, so we know who they are. The Briley brothers were the last of six convicts to be rounded up after their escape in the largest death row prison breakout in U.S. history. That was three weeks ago at Mecklenburg Correctional Center in Virginia. The Briley's will be arraigned in Philadelphia today on charges of unlawful flight to avoid confinement. The FBI wants to make certain the Briley's can't slip away again. Special Agent Trotter arranges to have them kept in federal custody. In these unlawful flight cases, usually as soon as you catch them, um, you dismiss the federal warrants and leave it uh, between the two states to work out, getting them back to where they belong. The FBI's out of it. But uh, we were able to keep these guys in federal custody long enough to uh, have them uh, return to Virginia through the federal system rather than uh, having to uh, go through state extradition proceedings. In the wake of the escape, Mecklenburg goes into lockdown. The governor of Virginia announces the firing of five guards. 
The warden and his security assistant are suspended without pay. An investigation by three independent consultants finds that conditions at Mecklenburg are highly dangerous and at times unmanageable. Two months after the escape, riots break out at the prison. Using homemade knives, inmates stab two guards and take six others hostage. Author Joe Jackson. A lot of violence in the prison before the escape, but once the escape occurred, that was like a symbol to a lot of the other prisoners. And so at that point, the lid blew off of Mecklenburg and there were riot. There was a big riot. It appears to be a repeat of earlier events. Only this time there is no escape. The standoff ends shortly after sunrise. Corrections Director Robert Landon resigns three months later. Before he leaves, Landon puts many changes into effect. Doors to the guards' restrooms are now locked all the time. Open stairwells where inmates could hide are boarded up. Stricter procedures are put in place. An interlock is installed on the main sally port, preventing both gates from opening at once. With these changes in place, Jim Lettner believes that such an escape could never happen again. Corrections were made to our institutions, both in, in the way jobs were performed, as well as, as new regulations that were, were instituted that makes our prisons more uh, apt to be escape free in the future. In October of 1984, as Linwood Briley's execution grows near, he is quoted as saying, at least I had my 19 days. Briley is the second man in 22 years to be executed in Virginia. But in the aftermath of the escape, officials step up the rate of executions. Six months after Linwood was put to death, James Briley follows his brother to the electric chair. In that same month, Earl Clanton Jr. pays the price for the two murders he committed. Derek Peterson, one of the first escapees to be recaptured, makes his final walk in 1991. Willie Jones is executed in 1993. Willie Turner masterminded the escape, but he remained behind because he had an appeal pending. Convinced of his innocence, he puts his faith in the system. Willie Turner is executed in 1995. By that time, the state of Virginia stopped using the electric chair. Turner's life is ended by lethal injection. An hour after the poison stops Turner's heart, his lawyer finds a loaded 32 caliber homemade gun inside a typewriter in his cell. Along with the weapon is a handwritten note that reads simply, smile. The last escapee to die is Lem Tuggle. On December 12, 1996, the convicted double murderer is led to the death chamber. Joe Giarratano, whose book passing started the escape, had his sentence commuted to life in prison. Of all the conspirators, he is the only survivor. The escape of the Mecklenburg Six shocked and terrified the nation for 19 days. The coordinated efforts of police and law enforcement officials returned the men to face the ultimate penalty for their crimes. Since the escape, the Commonwealth of Virginia has executed over 80 people. 
State-sanctioned execution continues to be hotly debated in Virginia, America, and around the world.